Today we're uh, picking up at topic eight. And um, if you recall, we were uh, talking about water last day and we had just started the minerals and we talked about calcium. So just a quick recap about calcium. Uh, calcium, the big one, of course, is the bones. That's about 99% of the calcium in your body is, is uh, on the bones. And, um, but it is crucial for all, all sorts of things. Um, all of our muscle contraction is reliant on calcium. Uh, calcium is involved in all sorts of other uh, minor processes and different tissues. You can see it's mentioning there about hormones and blood circulation and whatnot. But uh, for me, the big ones are bones, um, neuron functioning and muscle contraction. Although there are many, many other things. We also talked a little bit about um, uh, osteoporosis and uh, a little bit about uh, where we can get calcium from, which uh, dairy products uh, tend to be one of the better sources because our body absorbs it really well from dairy products. Although there are other sources, broccoli, and, um, I believe tofu and, and a few other uh, plant sources are not too bad. I think the other one I mentioned was eating fish with the bones. So sardines, I believe some people eat the whole fish. I'm not really sure about that, but I know that if you eat things with the bones in, you are getting calcium, there's calcium in the bones. Okay, so the second uh, mineral to talk about, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on most of the minerals, by the way, I think I alluded to that last day. Um, so I'll just go through them relatively quickly and kind of highlight a couple of things and some of them I will focus on a bit more. Phosphorus is one of the ones that I'm gonna go through relatively quickly. Um, it is quite abundant in the body. It's the second most abundant mineral. It's also found in the bones. So the minerals that are in the bones are made out of calcium and phosphorus, calcium being much more abundant than the phosphorus. Um, but phosphorus is essential for the bones and teeth. Uh, phosphorus is also essential for um, many other processes in the body. Uh, two of the ones that I think a lot about are uh, DNA and RNA because um, DNA and RNA actually have phosphates in them as part of the nucleotide structure. Uh, another one that I think of a lot is acid and base balance. So there's, um, there's actually a phosphorus uh, compound in your blood that is helping to maintain your blood's pH. And that's one of those buffering systems that's allowing our, our blood pH to, for the most part, remain uh, relatively constant. And phosphorus is part of that. Uh, I think I've got a little infographic here showing a whole bunch of things. You can see it's talking about energy levels, part of membranes. So phospholipids are made out of phospholipid, phosphorus, of course. And I mentioned the DNA and RNA structure and uh, just kind of found all over the place, pretty much anywhere that you have a nucleotide. So if you know a little bit of cell biology, nucleotides include DNA and RNA. And they also include ATP. So ATP is an energy uh, molecule in all of our cells. And the P, the TP stands for triphosphate, which is made out of phosphorus, of course. So phosphate, phosphorus is, is of course, very, very important. Um, so where can we get it from? Usually we're not seeing too many deficiencies in people. It's kind of abundant in most food groups to some degree. You can see milk products are, are pretty good and meat products are pretty good, but not too bad in in uh, vegetables and, and grain products. And uh, so phosphorus deficiencies, as far as I know of, are, are not that common. If you're getting enough calories, you're probably getting enough phosphorus. So that's all I really had to say about phosphorus. All right, moving on to potassium. So by the way, you might notice that the atomic symbol for phosphorus is a P. So that letter is already used up. So when we get to potassium, we can't use a P anymore. So potassium is a K. <laughs> so anyway, just a little bit of chemistry for you. Potassium is actually an ion. So you can see it has this charge here. It's a K plus. And uh, it's found in all of your cells. And again, it's something that's kind of just uh, really common um, throughout your body. And it's uh, similar to sodium in that it's helping to maintain a uh, proper amount of water in your in your cells. So you can see it's talking about here fluid and electrolyte balance. And um, a really big important one physiologically is that it's really important for your heartbeat and your nerve impulses, which also include your muscle contraction. So you can see some common themes here. Nerves require several different types of ions to function properly. Um, sodium and potassium uh, kind of being some of the big ones, but also, uh, also calcium, 
and, uh, and sometimes a few other ions are really important for those nerve impulses. And, uh, um, you know, something you can always look into, uh, if you Google on, uh, if you look on, on YouTube, look for a process of the action potential. And it talks a lot about those uh, different types of ions and what they're doing. Uh, what else was I going to say about potassium? Um, sometimes people get a little bit low on potassium. And um, as an essential electrolyte, uh, can cause a few issues here and there. Um, I'm not really sure why this is, but I've read several places that sometimes elderly people get potassium deficiencies, and I don't really know a lot about it. Uh, probably has to do with uh, what, they're, what they're having in their diet. I know we all get caught up in our diets. My parents in particular had a very, very simple diet. It was like toast for breakfast, a sandwich for lunch, meat and potatoes for supper, right? Uh, so you can see already in that whole thing, there's not, they weren't necessarily getting a lot of vegetables. And uh, that's actually where we can get a lot of potassium from, from various vegetables and, and fruits. Uh, potassium is also famous for being um, something that might be injected into people for lethal injection. Uh, I don't think they're using potassium anymore. I think they're using a different drug. But in the United States, you might know they have capital punishment and some people are getting these lethal injections and it used to be potassium. I don't think they use it anymore and I don't really know the, the details around that. But the big one for potassium is your heart and your nerves and your electrolytes. I think I might have a little slide showing some of the other functions. Yeah, so muscles, um, nutrient uptake, nerves, heart, and all these things are kind of interconnected, right? So you can see they're all, they're, these uh, functions are sort of pulling up some of the same things over and over again. Uh, where do we get potassium from? All sorts of things. Um, potassium is famous for being in bananas, but if you look at bananas, um, it's not that much different than a lot of other foods in there. Uh, like I said, a lot, of, uh, a lot of fruits and vegetables have a decent amount of potassium in them. Apparently sweet potatoes, is sweet potatoes on that list? I don't think it is. Uh, sweet potatoes are apparently a huge, huge source of potassium, even more so than bananas. And I believe I read somewhere that avocados are very rich in potassium and all sorts of green foods and, and those kind of things. You can see the, um, uh, the, the bread products are kind of on the low end, but there's a little bit in almost everything. And, uh, you know, if you have a balanced diet, most adults don't need to be worried about having a potassium deficiency. Um, well, I can see at the bottom there, it says uh, normal potatoes. So... Yes, they have potassium in them too. I just know sweet potatoes apparently is one of the big sources that has uh, a lot of potassium in them. I don't know how that compares to regular potatoes, but uh, anyway, not a bad food. So we'll take that one as it is. And uh, anyway, yeah, that's kind of it for potassium. So a couple of uh, short ones here, um, just kind of one sliders, uh, kind of worth mentioning just for a moment. Um, sulfur is considered an essential element. Uh, we don't usually digest it or consume it in the form of just pure sulfur. Um, sulfur is kind of a yellow powdery thing and that's what you'd have in like a, a matchstick and uh, it's not good to eat elemental sulfur, but we usually eat sulfur in the form of a sulfate. So sulfate is that compound, SO4, two negative. And uh, it's really just important for um, a couple of amino acids. There's two amino acids that have sulfur in it, um, methionine and cysteine. And they're uh, found in uh, certain structural proteins, uh, quite a few proteins in general. But uh, they're really essential for certain kind of, uh, I guess you would call them rigid, tough proteins. And um, so we're talking about hairs and nails and skin and those kind of things. And um, this is one of these things that it's uh, just kind of worth mentioning because it's essential, but uh, deficiencies. Um, you know, I don't think they've, as far as I know, there's actually no uh, really good data in humans. Um, they've, they've observed deficiencies in animals um, and we don't know if there's a maximum limit. So anyway, probably not something to worry about too much. All right, let's talk about sodium. Sodium is something to worry about. Um, most of us in here are probably not in the group that needs to worry about sodium. Um, usually when you're young, it's not as important to worry about sodium, um, but it can get a little bit more important as you get older and it's, it's certainly more important for, um, for some uh, categories. So sodium, we're getting this from salt. 
uh, table salt of sodium chloride. So that's a massive source of sodium. And if you take a look at the ingredients of a lot of processed foods, uh, sodium is sodium chloride is in almost everything. Uh, even I was looking at a package of, um, of pudding on the grocery store shelf and it had added salt. Right, I'm thinking, how sweet is this thing? How much sugar is in it? Instead, I realized it actually had quite a bit of salt in it. So I was quite surprised. But um, salt, of course, is um, famous for kind of drawing the flavor out of things. And if you bake cookies or anything like that, there's you know, usually at least half a teaspoon of salt in there that sort of helps to draw out the flavor. And salt can be actually quite, uh, quite tasty uh, on a lot of foods. And, um, and salt is zero calories. And it is important, right? It's important, again, like I mentioned, those nerves and, and neurons and muscle contraction, those are kind of the big ones uh, that I think about a lot, but it's also important for regulation of our body fluids and it is an essential electrolyte. Um, so it's a very, very essential um, uh, compound or mineral. But the problem is most of us get way too much and that's where the problem is. And um, so salt or sodium in particular, is, uh, is famous for uh, causing high blood pressure in some people. And as uh, so you can see, I have that big star beside there. And so what's the deal with high blood pressure? Uh, high blood pressure is, is pretty common. And um, the long-term problems with having high blood pressure is that you get too much, uh, uh, I guess, force in your arteries. And, uh, and that may eventually cause uh, health problems such as heart attacks or strokes or some sort of heart disease or something like that because there's too much pressure in the arteries. And so this is something that uh, is, is a lot more common as you, as you age uh, to have uh, hypertension or high blood pressure. And uh, you know it's not that uncommon when people reach their 40s or 50s where they have that doctor's appointment. And, you know, they usually take your blood pressure and suddenly you find out you have high blood pressure and you either get that talk about you should be cutting down salt in your diet or other than that, they might even uh, give you a prescription that you would be taking on a regular basis to help that high blood pressure. <clears throat> um, um, too much salt can have effects in other parts of your body. You can see it's talking about the brain and the heart and the kidneys here. When you have a lot of salt uh, in your diet, <clears throat> excuse me, I just feel like I'm gonna sneeze. <clears throat> okay, back to the kidneys. <laughs> um, when you have a lot of salt in your diet, it works your kidneys hard, is really the whole idea. And uh, you do this regularly, you know, over many decades, it, it can lead to kid kidney disease and kidney failure, and we, we don't want that kind of thing either. So salt is important. Most people are getting enough of it. And uh, in fact, many people are eating too much to cause problems. Um, there is in uh, certain Asian populations, there is higher rates of stomach cancer, and that has been linked to excessively high uh, salt intake. So I don't know what Asian populations those are, but I know I've certainly had a, a very salty, uh, I'm trying to remember what kind of restaurant that was in. It was a very salty soup. Maybe it was a Vietnamese restaurant. I'm not sure. That was a few years ago now, but I just remember the soup was very salty. <laughs> and uh, anyway, that, uh, there's apparently a link there as well. So uh, what else can we say about salt? Uh, how much, uh, where are we getting it from? Uh, this is from Stats Canada. And uh, you can see, uh, if you look at uh, uh, where we're getting salt from, all sorts of baked products, mixed dishes, processed products, pretty much anything that's processed, you're often looking at a lot of added salt. Um, this is the uh, daily recommended uh, allotment is about 1500 milligrams and not exceeding 2,300 milligrams. And the average Canadian intake is higher than that. So this is something that uh, Health Canada is thinking about a lot. And uh, I'm not sure why this is, but uh, apparently uh, females on average are actually slightly lower than that. And males on average are actually quite a bit higher than that. Uh, so males are around uh, 300, 3,000 milligrams per day. So I don't know what it is that males are eating that are different from females, uh, or whether it's just because uh, on average they are bigger humans and so consuming more calories. I'm not really sure what the, uh, what the link is behind that. Uh, or just different uh, snacking habits, uh, more chips or something like that. 
uh, just another infographic I found from Health Canada and uh, just putting the emphasis on processed foods, right? So that usually means things in a package uh, and um, just imagine all those processed foods and things like lunch meats, potato chips, crackers, chips. Take a look at the sodium on these things. And uh, if you ever have the chance, uh, you know, try buying a low sodium product. And in many cases, um, I don't really actually see much of a difference. I bought some low sodium Triscuits the other day and uh, um, I was trying to compare them. And when I compare them side by side, I could tell the difference. But uh, usually I'm putting something on that Triscuit, like a piece of cheese or something like that. And in that case, I didn't really notice any difference. So I wanted to show you, I was looking at um, just some, uh, some different condiments around the house and, uh, and in the grocery store. And so there's ketchup. And uh, so remember that number, 1500 uh, milligrams per day, right? So one, um, one tablespoon of ketchup, imagine if that's how much you use on a hamburger, uh, that's about one tenth of the amount of sodium that you're gonna use in a day. Um, that doesn't include the sodium in the bread, the bun, um, the burger, and so on, those kind of things. And uh, I was looking at a few other things here and uh, something that I really enjoy snacking on is pickles. And uh, this is just uh, Bix garlic pickles and apparently 540 milligrams for one pickle. Boom, my, my brain is like, wow, holy cow. Cause you know, I could easily eat three or four of these in a day in one sitting, Never mind. Um, here's another one I, uh, I saw, uh, soy sauce. So 730 milligrams, I could not believe it. And I know you can get low salt soy sauces. And uh, this is just one brand I was comparing a bunch of different brands. And this one was kind of in the middle. So there was one that was, I think, 840. Another one I found that was 480 or something like that. Um, but still, it's kind of eye-opening when you start to look at the labels. Now, this is not something that I think about a lot. Um, um, medically, my blood pressure is on the low end. In fact. Every time I've had my blood pressure taken, they comment on that. They're saying you're within a normal range, but it's quite low. Um, but maybe someday things will change. My parents both dealt with high blood pressure and there may be a day when my health does change in that direction and I'll have to be more conscious about my sodium intake. Uh, oh yeah, there's the information for the reduced sodium sauce from the same brand, uh, 530 milligrams. That's still a lot of, a lot of sodium. Uh, so people who are trying to hit that low sodium diet, uh, I'm not sure who invented this DASH diet. Uh, it's been kind of around for a while. It's one of those diets they're trying to recommend to people to uh, reduce their sodium. And generally what they're trying to do is get you to reduce your sodium and increase your potassium. So it turns out that a lot of those potassium rich foods we we're talking about, bananas, avocados, sweet potatoes, uh, are high potassium, low sodium. And that's apparently supposed to help with your blood pressure and your health issues and all those kind of things. And uh, so this DASH diet, uh, it's a formula diet. And uh, quite honestly, in a lot of ways, it doesn't look that different from your regular kind of food guide diet. Um, they're trying to encourage people to eat more fruits and vegetables and whole grains and uh, reduce the amount of um, uh, saturated fats uh, and limit the sweets and it's not really that different from kind of your typical food guide recommendations. Uh, you can see it's not quite the 50% fruits and, uh, and vegetables, but like I said, I don't really know who developed this. I just know it's been around for a long time and you can find all sorts of DASH diet guides out there. And uh, usually that's the goal is to try to educate people in terms of how they can reduce their sodium, uh, particularly if they're concerned about hypertension and, and the effects of, uh, of uh, high blood pressure. Okay, so the other half of uh, table salt, sodium chloride is of course the chloride. And uh, I don't really have a lot to say about chloride. Chloride is not one of those ions, those electrolytes that uh, affects you uh, in, in a negative way. It's just you, most people are not going to be uh, deficient of it because they're getting lots of salt in their diet. It's not usually causing us too many problems. It's also part of that uh, uh, fluid balance in and outside of your cells. Um, and uh, it's actually part of hydrochloric acid. So hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric acid is actually this. This is the compound hydrochloric acid, HCl. So you can see the Cl 
and come from the salt. So it is an essential, um, an essential element and uh, not usually too many concerns about people getting too much or too little. Okay, moving on, magnesium. So I told you I was gonna go through some of these pretty quick. I'm really just focusing on certain ones. Um, oh, sorry, Joanna, I see there's a, a comment there uh, in, in messages and she says she was in the hospital for a month with kidney problems and was placed on very limited salt diet and was only allowed 10% a day. It was super hard and had to set an nutrition facts and everything. Yeah, yeah, actually it's, it's really hard to go, um, to go really low salt like that. Uh, that is a very uh, small amount to have. And um, I know uh, my mother in her later years when she had to adjust to that, uh, uh, initially found it hard. And um, eventually she actually got to a point where she was getting so little salt that she couldn't eat certain foods because she thought they were too salty. Uh, so maybe that was a good thing for her uh, to, to stop liking salt so much. Uh, a lot of young people, by the way, crave salt, right? Particularly if you're young and active and it's just part of uh, needing those electrolytes and it's not necessarily the sodium that you need. Um, it just means that your, your metabolism is relatively high. Okay, let's talk about magnesium for a minute. Um, magnesium is also in our bones and uh, magnesium is also, uh, uh, magnesium, uh, again, thinking about cellular biology, which is usually where I come from, uh, in terms of thinking about things, um, is actually essential for stabilizing nucleic acid structures, so DNA and RNA and those kind of things. Um, but it's one of those um, minerals that is kind of doing a lot of those other things. It's, it's also a little bit part of, uh, of uh, muscle contraction. Uh, and uh, um, I don't think it's part of your neurons, but it is part of your muscles. And uh, because it's uh, stabilizing nucleic acids, it also is stabilizing ATP, which is your body, body's energy source. And so it's essential for, for that. Um, you don't hear a lot about people being deficient too much. It does happen once in a while, people who just are malnourished in general. So often we're talking about uh, uh, sometimes yeah, people who are extreme alcoholics or people who are, are malnourished for other uh, reasons. And uh, I don't know a lot about the deficiencies. You can see there's some symptoms written there, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, sorry, caused by, uh, but uh, in, in terms of uh, what the symptoms of deficiency, I don't actually know a lot about it. You don't hear about it too much. Uh, I thought I had a little, uh, okay, I thought I had a little chart showing the functions of, uh, of magnesium. But like I said, the big ones for me are thinking of stabilizing a DNA structure and involved in ATP structure, which is used for your body's energy. Uh, where are we getting magnesium from? Um, a little bit from most of the food groups. Apparently pumpkin seeds are exceptionally high in magnesium. Um, certain types of breads. Uh, and it's one of those things you only need in small amounts. And so small amounts in all of the food groups is usually where we get it from. Like I said, deficiency is not usually a big, uh, uh, something you hear about uh, ever. Okay, so those are the major minerals. And uh, all of those we have in, um, larger quantities, so we're talking about the, uh, the milligrams to grams kind of quantities. The minor minerals, these are ones that are more trace quantities, uh, iron being the biggest one, and iron being very important in your blood. So we're going to talk a lot about iron here. Yes. So iron is found in every cell. It's part of some enzymes, and particularly iron is part of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is that protein that's shown on the right, and uh, you can see the little iron in there and the heme group. And so this is a protein that carries blood from your lungs to your tissues. There's a related protein that you may not have heard about called myoglobin. And myoglobin also has iron in it. And what it does is it stores oxygen in your tissues, particularly your muscle tissues. So myoglobin uh, is sitting there with oxygen in your muscles. And that way, uh, you know, let's say you're sitting down on your couch and you decide to get up, well, you have oxygen right there ready, and, uh, or you decide to go for a jog. So your muscles have a certain amount of oxygen kind of stored there in the tissues. Myoglobin is, uh, is like hemoglobin, it's red, and so that's why, um, that's why our muscle tissues are, are red. Um, not just because of the blood in there, but because of the myoglobin that's found in those, uh, in those tissues. And 
And so, you know, you might call it red meat as well. And that means there's a lot of myoglobin in there. So this is kind of the biggest use of iron. And so blood is obviously very important. Um, there's other uses for iron, like I said, it's in every, t every uh, cell in your body for, uh, it's found in some enzymes and whatnot, but the big one, of course, is for our blood. And, um, and blood is important. And it turns out that uh, it, as humans, we cycle through our blood cells um, quite regularly. I'm not sure how many days they last. Um, I, I think it's like a week or 10 days, your kind of your average lifespan of your, of your typical red blood cell. And, uh, and a lot of them um, basically get expelled from the body. So that's gonna be part of your feces that actually leads to a lot of a brown color in your, in your uh, stools. Um, when you go to the washroom. Uh, so we kind of need to replace our iron all the time. And uh, so this is, uh, this is a very important thing to have in our diet to certain degrees. Um, when we talk about iron in the diet, uh, usually we talk about uh, two types of sources, uh, heme iron food sources and non-heme iron food sources. So it turns out that the heme iron food sources, that basically means we're getting it from um, myoglobin or hemoglobin from other organisms. So this means we're eating their flesh, right? So you eat some red meat or some fish or some poultry or something like that. And uh, in, their, in their muscle tissue, they have proteins like us that are holding on to iron. And it turns out we absorb those more efficiently. I don't really know what the mechanism behind that is uh, as to why we absorb that, uh, that more uh, readily. Um, and, but, but it means that, uh, you know, if you have... Um, if you have meat in your diet, you're probably getting enough heme uh, as long as you get enough protein in your diet. The non-heme iron sources, again, depending on the source, um, some of these foods, it's, it's actually very hard for our body to get the iron out of. Uh, it's like 10% efficient, some is like 40% efficient. And uh, I think that's because uh, in some of these foods, I believe, um, I think in soybeans, there's actually a chemical in the soybeans that binds the iron really tightly. And so it's hard for our body to get the iron out of it, if I remember that correctly. But iron in lots of foods, we'll talk about some iron foods here in a minute. Uh, there's also some foods that unfortunately prevent us from uh, or slow us down from absorbing iron. Uh, tea and coffee being uh, one of those in that group. Uh, there's a few other foods that, uh, that uh, decrease uh, iron absorption. I can't remember them off the top of my head. I'm just trying to think of ginger was another one, but uh, I really can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but if you want to increase your iron absorption, then vitamin C is the key. So eating your, your, uh, um, the, your fruits, uh, particularly the sweet, sour fruits, uh, tend to have lots of vitamin C, and, and that's going to help. Uh, cooking plant foods, so there's iron in broccoli, uh, and you can absorb more iron from cooked broccoli than you can from raw broccoli. So, you know, there's another tip for you. So it's important that we talk a little bit about iron deficiency because this is, this is uh, really common, and uh, it's, actually, um, it's actually relatively common amongst college and university students uh, as well. Um, probably the, the biggest group uh, in Canada that, that should be most concerned about iron deficiency is actually pregnant women, um, particularly um, women who are malnourished. Uh, but, uh, you know, I say college and university students because, uh, you know, often people, they move away from home and, and uh, they're cooking for themselves and they find out that meat is expensive. And so, you know, maybe you're, you're eating less meat and not getting a balanced diet. And, and so this kind of thing is, is relatively common. Um, when you are deficient in iron, um, even at a low level, uh, you're looking at basically fatigue. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about why that is in a minute, but you need iron for your, your blood, right? So you're not getting enough red blood cells. So it's pretty hot, common for people to be iron deficient and, um, and they have fatigue and, and, you know, kind of their productivity is kind of reduced a little bit. And, um, you know, and if, if that's the case for you, then you know, maybe you could consider iron supplementation. Uh, for, for pregnant women, um, it's even more important because you're making a lot more blood. You're, you're, making, you're filling a whole placenta with blood and you're trying to provide a fetus with blood. And so it's really important for pregnant women to make sure they get enough iron uh, in, their, in their system. Uh, worldwide, uh, it's apparently really common. And uh, 
mainly it has to do with malnutrition. People are often not getting, uh, you know, they're living off of, let's say, rice is the staple and it's 80, 90% of their diet and not getting a lot of uh, other variety, particularly meat in their, in their diet. Um, so uh, if you take a look, this is just kind of a little chart showing iron deficiency, right? So this, uh, this stage one of iron deficiency, you know, you have a little less uh, blood, you're maybe a little tired, and uh, this can lead to something called anemia. So anemia basically means you don't have enough red blood cells. And there are different reasons for having anemia. I mentioned a while ago, sickle cell anemia, that's a genetic disorder. Um, but the biggest cause of anemia is just not having enough iron in your diet. And uh, so there's different stages of it. You can see iron deficiency anemia and then just flat out anemia. When you get to stage three, um, that's really, really bad. And this is something that is important, not just for energy, but also important for your brain. And uh, children who are iron deficient uh, can actually, this can actually affect their IQ. And uh, so this is why it's a big concern uh, in developing countries because we want, well, we want children to develop into healthy adults, right? And so, you know, trying to figure out what to do about this is a, is a big deal. Uh, there is, I uh, thought I had, okay, maybe that's coming up in a couple of slides here. Uh, one thing that they're trying to encourage in, uh, in some countries is uh, more use of cast iron pans. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Here's um, a picture showing some normal and anemic red blood cells. And uh, you can see these, uh, these smaller ones here, uh, kind of they're kind of shrunken and folded over and uh, they're gonna contain a lot less hemoglobin, which means less oxygen and blood the body and when you don't get oxygen you can't uh, you can't use your fuel in your body and you're just you know, you're going to be sluggish and whatnot um, you can see there are the mental symptoms when you start get to uh, extreme anemia um, and like I said it's affecting the brain and can lower the IQ and, and all sorts of things like that okay so why aren't we just supplementing iron everywhere that's one of the questions um, we we're talking about um, vitamin D supplementation in the milk right? Um, so we could fortify our foods with iron, but there's a problem with iron is that you can have an iron overload. This is called hema, hemochromatosis, okay? And uh, so this is something that we also don't want to have happen. And the problem is that uh, if we fortified certain foods with iron, then we'd have a lot more of this uh, in, in the population, this iron overload. Um, it, there are hereditary and genetic reasons for people having um, extra iron in their body, uh, but also this is affecting your energy levels. And I don't really know how that works uh, in terms of uh, what is going on physiologically, but you can see some of the symptoms there. So liver failure, abnormal heartbeats. So those things are, are bad, bad, bad. So where do we get iron from? So we mentioned we can get iron from meat products, meat products that have heme in them. And uh, certain vegetables tend to be iron high. Uh, certain cereals in particular tend to have, um, have quite a bit of iron in them. I don't know whether that's because they're fortified or not. Uh, I just know that I've seen that advertised on boxes of certain products and uh, a little bit in certain vegetables and uh, soy apparently uh, has a decent amount of iron in it as well. Um, so two things to comment about this. One is um, these cast iron pans here. And uh, so this is something that um, you see it once in a while on, on, on health groups on the internet, encouraging people to cook with cast iron pans to increase your iron levels. Uh, my understanding is there's, there's a little bit of research on this and shows that it can help. Um, certain types of foods cooked, and I don't know if it has something to do with the pH or whatever, seem to draw the iron out more and you're gonna get it into your system. It's not gonna be heme iron, so you're not gonna absorb it extremely well but it can add a little bit. Uh, they're, they're, they basically, they're telling people, don't try to get all your iron just by cooking in a pan. You do wanna make sure you have it in your diet, but that may help a little bit and give you a bit of a boost. So if you're interested in cooking cast iron, then, then there you go, go nuts. That's a good reason to have it. But they are encouraging this uh, in a lot more um, uh, uh, developing countries, uh, cast iron pans, or uh, there's uh, like a, Sometimes they ask people, they, they tell people you can stick this iron, basically a chunk of iron in your, in your soup or your stew, and you don't eat it, but it's gonna be uh, 
you know, as it cooks, it's going to release some iron in the food. So it's kind of an interesting thing that they're trying to figure out how to help people in developing countries. So you may notice um, for adults here, we have men, uh, it's recommended eight milligrams a day. And women basically double that. And pregnant women basically triple that. Uh, and uh, there's, there's very good reason for this. Uh, women, you probably know that, uh, you know, you menstruate and you're losing blood. So for anybody who's losing blood, uh, extra iron is always a good thing to have because you need to replace the blood that you've lost. Pregnant women are producing a lot of extra blood, like I said, for the placenta, and that's, uh, that's a big deal. I see somebody's mentioning her uncle had uh, hemochromatosis and he's not supposed to cook in cast iron. Yeah, so like I said, I, I don't know a lot about it, uh, except that there are a couple of genetic disorders that somehow cause it. And I don't exactly know how that works. Maybe they're just extra efficient at absorbing iron from food uh, or something like that. I'm not sure how that works, uh, but I know it does happen once in a while. Usually you hear more about iron deficiencies uh, than you do uh, the other way around, but it does happen. Okay, I'm just checking my notes. I think that's all I had to say about iron. And uh, so, you know, if you are one of those college students that is concerned about their energy levels, uh, you know, sometimes it's worth it to take a little look at your diet. You can get supplements for, for iron. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about zinc. Um, so zinc is one of those, uh, one of those metals that's kind of just found everywhere. Uh, it's found in tons and tons of enzymes. Uh, as, a, as basically a cofactor, meaning it's helping the enzyme to do whatever its function is. And uh, so what does that mean? We're, we're looking at all sorts of different functions uh, in the body. You can see some of them are listed on there, gene expression, uh, wound healing, sperm production. Um, I know it has something to do with the brain as well. And the reason why I know that is because a, a, a zinc deficiency uh, can actually lead to mental um, uh, mental retardation or, or not proper development of the, of the brain uh, somehow. And I don't really know the mechanism behind that. I just know zinc is found just kind of in every cell because it's found in all sorts of different, uh, different proteins. Um, thought I had a slide. Maybe I don't. I thought I had a slide of all the zinc functions. Like I said, it's just a huge number of things. Um, apparently, if you eat too much zinc, though, it can affect the absorption of some of your other minerals. And I don't really know a lot about that. I just know I've seen warnings about that, about people who are taking zinc supplements and then they find out they're, they're deficient in something else because they're overdoing the zinc. Um, and I know zinc has been thrown out there as kind of a, I don't know, a wonder mineral to a wonder supplement. And a lot of people are seen really concerned about zinc deficiencies. And I don't think that's really that common in Canada. Um, but I'm not entirely sure about that. I know it's also involved that has something to do with vitamin A and vision. Like I said, the list of what zinc does is super long. It's hard to remember uh, too much about it. Uh, so I'm not really gonna talk a lot about zinc. It's important to get, most of us are getting lots of it. Um, 11 milligrams, eight milligrams a day, that's tons. Uh, you can get it from most of the food groups, a little less so from the fruits and vegetables, uh, but most of us are not having a zinc problem. So what about copper? Again, copper is something we need in tiny, tiny amounts. Um, and uh, you can find it in a bunch of food sources. And uh, sometimes we have it in our water uh, because sometimes we have copper pipes in our house. My house has copper pipes. I've never actually tested my own water, um, but I've tested the college water and the college water has small amounts of copper in it. And uh, that's not a bad thing. Um, we need it for uh, collagen and hemoglobin for some reason. I don't, again, that's something I'm not really familiar with the mechanism behind uh, where it's involved, uh, but it's also found in, in certain enzymes um, and as part of the functioning as cofactors. And that's kind of all I have to say about copper. A little bit to say about iodine. Uh, iodine, oh, you see there's another comment. Um, oh yes, I, I, okay. Thank you, I couldn't remember what that was. The lucky iron fish. That is the thing that I was talking about uh, that they uh, believe it's world vision is handing out to people in developing countries. So it's a chunk of iron in the shape of a fish. And you put it in liquids when you're cooking, so with your iron intake. I could not remember the, 
what it was. I knew it was shaped like something. It's a fish. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, iodine. Let's talk about iodine. Uh, iodine is um, it's a halogen and uh, it's a brown chemical and uh, it is part of thyroxine. So you're probably wondering what is that thing? Oops, thyroxine. Just going to underline it here for you. So thyroxine is a hormone and it's made by your thyroid. So your thyroid gland is kind of in your neck, right? And um, it's one of those hormones that has roles in a whole bunch of things. It has roles in digestion, heart function, muscle function, brain development, and uh, something to do with the bones. I don't know if it's maintenance of bones or development of bones. Um, the, the, two, the two that I think a little bit about are muscle and, uh, and uh, heart function, but also brain development. And so it turns out that iodine deficiency is actually one of the world's most common um, and preventable causes of, um, of improper mental development. Um, and uh, so it can be solved just by making sure people have it in their diet. Uh, one of the deficiencies of iron that's, that's uh, well known um, is something called goiter. And so goiter, you can see that woman on the right, uh, her, um, her thyroid gland is, is enlarged and, uh, and that's basically goiter. And that's something that uh, used to be common 100, 150 years ago before we really understood what, uh, uh, what was going on and that it, was a, that it was an iodine deficiency. You can see the second uh, type of deficiency listed there is, uh, is basically uh, uh, improper development that, uh, uh, like I said, usually um, you hear about this having to do with mental um, deficiencies uh, in developing children. Um, so the thyroid gland, you may know, is a super important uh, gland and producing all sorts of hormones that are involved in all sorts of processes around the body in terms of uh, metabolism and energy usage. And, you know, if people have thyroid problems, sometimes it leads to weight gain or weight loss and those kind of things. And thyroxine is one of the, the major, um, uh, one of the major hormones that is made by the thyroid. So you may have noticed I flipped to the next slide and just saying, where can we get iodine from? Uh, we can get iodine from table salt. So notice right here on the label, iodized table salt. Um, regular table salt, they add iodine to it. Actually, look at the ingredients on your table salt. It actually has three ingredients. Uh, it's not just sodium chloride. It has the iodine and it has, uh, I can't remember the other chemical that uh, is trying to prevent it from sticking together. And you might know this if you buy specialized salt, Sometimes people buy a sea salt or non-iodized salt and it sticks together uh, and clumps and can be a pain. Um, and that's because it's not treated. And so we put the iodine in there. And when we started doing this like hundred years ago or something like that, goiter kind of uh, disappeared. Uh, kids were not getting it anymore. Um, where do we get iodine from? All sorts of food sources, uh, kind of depends on the soil. This is one of these things that, uh, you know, soil in different parts of the country has high amounts or low amounts. And, and it's uh, kind of, it's, sometimes it's hard to predict which foods actually have iodine because it's more soil based. But most of us are getting enough of it because we're getting lots of salt in our diet. And uh, a lot of that salt is, is, um, is just coming from one of these types of boxes. Okay, so a couple other minerals uh, to talk about. Um, I had mentioned fluoride. Uh, last day when we were talking about water. So fluoride is a non-essential element, meaning we do not need fluoride, as far as we know, in our diet to live. Um, we do get in our diet. It's found naturally in some foods and found naturally in a lot of waters. Uh, this is something that uh, is put into the water in a lot, of, uh, a lot of municipalities. And if you follow the news, they uh, recently, uh, I think it was five years ago in Calgary, they took it out of the water. They figured they were going to save $10 million a year. And uh, the dental advocates decide, you know, push back and they're apparently reintroducing the fluoride into the water. Uh, and there's a lot of really good, um, there are tons and tons of studies uh, showing that fluoride uh, in small amounts can actually strengthen the teeth. And these are something called, um, you could call them natural experiments where you have uh, you know, one city that has fluoride naturally in the water, in the river, and another city that doesn't. 
And you can look at the dental records uh, as a, at one population versus the other to show this. So this is why people started adding fluoride into the water, because of course uh, we realized that there's an added benefit to it. And for the most part, um, it's not that expensive. Uh, I think it is more so now, but initially it used to be, a, it used to cost, I think it was uh, um, 50 years ago, I believe the costs were initially a, about a dollar a person. Uh, so that's not really a big part of a, of a town's budget. Um, the costs have gone up uh, quite a bit, uh, partly due to safety and making sure that the fluoride being used is, uh, is pure and not contaminated and things like that. Um, but uh, it's, um, if, you, if you put too much fluoride, um, there is a problem with that. Um, and you can see this, this problem with too much fluoride is called fluorosis. And what you're looking at is uh, basically staining of teeth. Um, it's not something that is bad for the person and that's making them sick. Uh, the teeth are still hard, um, but it's just cosmetically not good. So Health Canada um, in the water guidelines for Canada has reduced the amount of fluoride that's allowed to be added in water. And that's why Fort McMurray doesn't add fluoride anymore because there's natural fluoride in the Athabasca River water. And uh, sometimes it gets, uh, it gets close to that, that, that number that Health Canada has, has added. So they don't wanna add extra and exceed that number that Health Canada is recommending. It also saves the city about a million dollars a year. So one of those things. And um, there's, there's lots I could say about fluoride, by the way. Um, you can see there's some maps here talking about access to fluoride, fluoridated water. Uh, it's something that you see, uh, you know, different countries uh, kind of have, uh, some countries have more fluoridation, some countries don't have any water fluoridation. And it's one of those funny things that I find certain people have a really strong opinion about fluoridation. Um, if you Google water fluoridation, uh, you are looking at going down uh, an internet rabbit hole of conspiracy theories. And uh, um, most of the information that you'll find about these conspiracy theories is junk. Um, I'll, I'll just say that. Uh, it's something that I don't feel passionate about, that I need to join a parade or a march to, uh, um, to the city hall to say, please fluoridate the water or please don't. Um, we have fluoride in our toothpaste. If you feel that badly against fluoride, then I guess you're going to use some non-fluoridated toothpaste. But it does work. It makes your teeth stronger. Okay, so there's a few others. Um, if you look in the textbook, it kind of has a paragraph on, on a bunch of these other things. Chromium, I really know very little about chromium. Apparently it works with insulin. You can see there's some food sources there, nuts and cheese and things like that. I'll never ask you about chromium on a test um, or selenium either. Like I said, there's a bunch of these that, that the amounts we need are teeny, teeny, tiny amounts in our diet. And so they're probably all sort of essential for uh, certain enzymes. So enzymes that you find in some tissues and often in very, very small amounts. Uh, there's a whole bunch of trace minerals out there that uh, when you look at the research, uh, there's an indication that we need tiny amounts in the human diet. And uh, a lot of these here um, are toxic if people overdo it. I've never seen supplements for any of these things. I've never seen cobalt or nickel supplements or anything like that. Manganese, maybe, I'm not sure, but all of these things are things we need in tiny, tiny amounts. Most of us have nothing to worry about. Um, I'm not really aware of the, of the data on these things. And I won't, won't ask about any of these on the test, but you can, you can look into them. Uh, I was looking for kind of a way to summarize all of this. And I found this, um, this image on the internet. Um, it's a very simplistic summary of everything. You can see phosphorus bones, right? I would probably add to that bones and then you know, DNA and phospholipids, right? That's the way I would look at phosphorus, for example. Uh, but anyway, there's kind of a summary slide that's kind of highlighting some of the things that we did talk about. I don't know what the connection between magnesium and stress is. I'm not really sure about what that's all about, um, but uh, I didn't make this particular image. Just thought I'd show it to you as a bit of a summary slide on the, on the minerals. Okay, so that's it for the minerals. Uh, so quiz eight is now posted on Moodle. So um, that will be due uh, next week.